As we grow older, our bodies and our appearance start to change. We are hardwired by society to do almost anything possible to resist the effects of aging. But what if I told you that there's an alternative to these surface level modifications to our appearance? What if I told you that we could rewire our cells and use our own biology to combat aging? Now this might sound like science fiction, uh, something like rapid regeneration by some superhero, but in fact this breakthrough could soon be on the shelves for many of us to buy. This is part two of our deep dive into Siniska, a startup company looking to reverse cellular aging and cure things from wrinkles to neurological diseases. This is a spin-out company from the University of Exeter that's been created to take the research discovery of one Professor Lorna Harries all the way to market. Basically, we have uncovered a new mechanism by which cells age. So what Siniska is doing is we've uncovered the kind of the master control genes that control this process, and we can target them so that we can now use oligonucleotide therapies to restore their expression back to where it would be in young cells, which brings about cellular rejuvenation. What Siniska are aiming to do is to access the genes within this damaged DNA to master them, control them, and to turn them back on so that these cells can be resurrected and rejuvenated. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much deeper kind of technical detail with the science in this section, but if you're interested, check out part one. I'll pop a link up here and in the video description down below. But Siniska's method relies on something called oligonucleotides, which I promise is the longest word that we'll be using today. Uh, these are short molecules, short strands of DNA or RNA. Chances are you've heard probably quite a bit about DNA. DNA we've made a lot of advances in, uh, in, in recent years and really has become kind of the poster child of biology. But until recently, you might not have heard to the same extent about RNA, as Lorna put it. RNA biology and, and the potential of RNA, it's always been a little bit of the kind of the poor cousin of DNA. A loose analogy I like to kind of get my head around this idea is that DNA is kind of like a textbook. It's full of information across a vast array of different subjects and all of these subjects together allow the cell to kind of operate. RNA is the useful snippets, individual snippets of knowledge that do something specific. RNA is the useful kind of take home messages. It allows you to do something like encode a particular protein, express a particular gene, actually implement these building blocks of the cellular behavior. So although DNA gets a lot of attention, it's RNA that actually does the hard work. Where DNA has opened up uh, an absolutely immense ability to understand genetic material, to understand traits and behaviors, we're only really scratching the surface. RNA therapies open up the potential to target genes within the cell that actually can cause disease and speak to them in the cell's own native language, essentially writing our own little new snippets of that textbook. The example that you probably heard about that really showcases the power of RNA is the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine, which contains some of the RNA of the COVID-19 virus. And essentially what happens is that your body takes in uh, this, this special bit of messenger RNA and it produces the proteins that usually the virus would cause you to produce, but in a way that your body can deal with in a way that your body can learn to produce an immune response to and actually producing RNA vaccines producing a vaccine using RNA rather than a dead or, or deformed or broken version of the disease itself is not only in theory much faster and cheaper it's also much safer in the long run but they are unbelievably up up until this point they've been unbelievably difficult to actually build so a little bit I guess of the silver lining of this pandemic we've really looked for new ways to rapidly vaccinate against different diseases. And in so doing, we've developed this kind of new tool set, this new set of abilities to really play with and control RNA. And as a result, it has forced a real inflection point into what we can do and how fast we can do it. I don't think there's ever been a better time to start an RNA therapeutics company. It's brought RNA biology and, and the potential of RNA to the forefront. As Lorna said, this RNA technology based on uh, cellular pathways, which are common to all cells, has applications across many areas. Because senescence, the, the problem that uh, Lorna has learned to unpick and, and to solve to rejuvenate, is the start of many different diseases and essentially could be used to target anything from wrinkles to cardiovascular diseases to dementia. 
um, we could use it for anything actually that's driven by um, senescence. So that was a really difficult decision was, you know, what do we start with? Because I obviously would love to go after things like dementia, but obviously that's, um, you've got things like the blood brain barrier, which is a bit of a, a problem. With such a vast potential for applications to solve problems associated with senescence, how on earth do you begin to decide where to start first? This position that Lorna and the Seniska team are in is something called technology push. If you're a scientist, if you're a researcher and you discover something in the lab, this is most likely the position that you will find yourself in, armed with some amazing piece of technology or capability, but what exactly you do with that discovery and in what order can oftentimes actually be a bit confusing. So we've chosen a couple of indications. We have, we have two basic strands. We have a skin aging strand. Um, which was born about basically because we were approached by a, a big cosmetics corporate um, who want to work with us to develop this. And then the other one is a, a more sort of pharmaceutical arm, which is looking at a condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So this is a, a catastrophic fibrosing condition of the lung that there's no cure for, and it's driven by senescence. The important thing to remember if you are ever in this sort of position is that you can't be everything to everyone. It's far better to focus on delivering something specific, executing one thing really, really well, rather than juggling several things uh, and only making incremental kind of progress in any of them. Otherwise, you know, you start to need like an infinite amount of resources and an infinite plane. And as, you know, physicist hat on, that's totally fine. We can deal with that. Business hat on, probably not gonna happen. The applications that Lorna have chosen have a good balance of something called barrier to entry, how difficult they are to actually enter into the marketplace, uh, how easy they are to actually produce from a technological point of view, how feasible the technology maps to solve this particular problem, and the size of the opportunity at the end of the day, how many customers there will be in the market and how many will be able to ultimately adopt your solution. It's tough, but saving the world has to be economically worthwhile. Uh, otherwise, no one helps you in the process, which is always something that kind of struck me as a bit strange, but is absolutely the way things are. Beyond that point, it gets even harder because not only do you need to understand where you should be applying your technology, but you need to understand the best strategy to package up that technology and deliver it into the marketplace. That bit of the process is called a productization strategy. We're starting with things that you, organ systems that you can get at from the outside. So lung, eye, joint. Um, so we're looking at IPF, but we're also looking at osteoarthritis, which is a huge problem, huge public health problem. And we're also looking at age-related uh, dry macular degeneration. And we've chosen those because it means we don't have to deliver our treatments systemically. We can do a local treatment. So for the skin, obviously it's, it's topical or injected. For the eye and the joint, it'll be injected. For the lung, it will be inhaled. And these are all delivery mechanisms that patients and clinicians are quite happy with. I, I think a really interesting example uh, that Lorna highlights is the eye. It's a common target for gene therapies as the eye is a really small organ, meaning actually targeting uh, all of the cells is actually a realistic possibility. It's a closed system also, which means that uh, it doesn't really interface with the rest of the body. So you have a simpler set of parameters to understand and control. Uh, and you can minimize the risk of whatever therapy that you are using, messing with other tissues that you maybe don't want to be targeting. You also hear Lorna saying something incredibly smart. They are choosing productization strategies, ways of packaging these technologies that there is already known and accepted clinical practice for. The eye and the joints, they're going for a, a, a method of injection, which although sounds horrible, is the kind of clinically approved way of doing these things and to target the skin, they're doing a topical application. So Niska are aiming to build something that will be to the patient and to the clinician, uh, a like for like replacement in terms of how they use it, but with hopefully better efficacy, better results uh, than what's currently on the market. This is important because changing behaviors of people, of customers is really hard. So don't do it if you don't have to do it. So for Seniska, having this RNA based technology that targets cells and turns them back on and rejuvenates them, when they discovered that, surely there was absolutely no doubt that this thing could be commercialized. So as I say, we, 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 we were not thinking about commercialization at all. But actually, in retrospect, in hindsight, if you look at it, having something which can cause cells to regenerate is obviously going to be commercially very viable. But we, we really, I, I really wasn't thinking that way. And it wasn't until we had some approaches from potential investors that I thought, oh, actually, maybe we need to think about this. Lorna's answer here brings up a really interesting point uh, that kind of broadly is summarized as the, the European paradox, uh, which isn't a particularly catchy title, but essentially boils down to the idea that 
within academic institutions across across the UK and Europe, uh, if those are two separate things now, um, we aren't very good as scientists at taking our discoveries and actually translating them into benefit for the world. Uh, oftentimes because we don't really think to. It's interesting that you sometimes as a researcher need industry to actually turn up and say, you know, you're onto something really good, really interesting for you to kind of get the kick to say, oh, maybe there is some potential here and maybe I should try and take it into the marketplace and, and see what I can make of it. I had a lot of help and advice from our tech transfer team at the university who've been wonderful, um, sort of taking us and walking us, you know, taking us by the hands and walking us through this process because it's a whole new skill set that actually most academics are not trained for. I really like to highlight examples like Lorna's where she's not only come up with something fantastic, but is also the person that is taking this into the market herself not relying on industry to come in and scoop up the idea and, and run with it, actually taking the initiative to deliver on that possibility herself. I think that's really cool. We've got big plans. We're starting small, but we're going to grow. The Siniska team seem to be going a million miles an hour at the moment. They've just closed their first seed round of 1.3 million, uh, which is pretty large for uh, a first seed round coming into an early stage university company. So all things look really positive at this point in time. But I just want to wish them good luck. Uh, I look forward to kind of tracking their progress. Uh, and hopefully one day in the not too distant future, we'll look forward to growing old. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you would target first if you had this anti-aging technology capability behind you. Uh, support the channel with a like if you like this. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.